I have, uh, I have another one over there. Mackenzie, wave your hand. That's, that's my 19-year-old. Yeah, I know you're wondering how a 29-year-old has a 19-year-old, but uh, it's good to have her and her mother. And uh, Brad uh, Minger's here today. And I think, Brad, you were at um, uh, Garden Cathedral when, when, was Hannah born or was Julia almost, was Hannah almost born? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Hannah was real young. We held a revival over there, but uh, it's good to be here. It's a great spirit, isn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Name tag Sunday, huh? Name tag month. So remember, as Pastor said, hold on to those things. Uh, if not, Kim will chase you down because uh, she's a name tag giver and everything. So, uh, hey, turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to start reading in verse 21. We're going to be talking about fire and sacrifice today. So 1 Kings chapter 18, that's the Old Testament. If you're in 2 Kings, Mickey, take a left and you'll find 1 Kings chapter 18. That's becoming like a dad joke, isn't it, Shell? It's, it's becoming pretty bad. So uh, I'm going to read this to you. You, got, you can read with me if you would. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long do you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people's response was, and the people answered him not a word. They could not accept if it was better to be with Yahweh or if it was better to be with Baal. Remember that. Verse 22. Then Elijah said unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bollocks and let them choose one bollock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people said, it is well spoken. Basically, they said, Elijah, this is a great idea. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it, for ye are many, and call upon the name of your gods, and put no fire under. And they took the bullet which was given to them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And listen, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry louder, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is on vacation, or prevention he's asleep, and you have to wake him up. That's a little, uh, little swag there, isn't it? So, uh, um, so he said, and verse 28, And they cried aloud. Basically in the Hebrew, they cried even louder. Their first cry was nothing compared to this second cry. And then they cut themselves, the Bible says, after the manner with knives and lancelets, till the blood gushed out upon them and came to pass when midday was past. And they prophesied until the time of the offering of that evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Now listen to what Elijah did. And Elijah said in verse 30, And to all the people, Come near to me. And the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Listen to what he did. Right now, the stage is set. They're going to have a fire off. Whose God can answer first? It's a very similar thing as uh, David and Goliath. It's a very similar thing to uh, uh, Jericho and, and Joshua and the Israelites. But here... We have two gods pitted against each other over people who can't decide who they're serving. And the Bible says that before anything was done, and Elijah said, you guys come to me, come near unto me, and he repaired the altar for it was broken. Remember that, verse 31. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. It was a big trench. 
and put, he put the wood in order and cut the bullocks into more pieces and laid wood onto them and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the birth sacrifice and on the wood. What don't you want to do when you're trying to get fire? You don't want to soak everything down. Remember that. So the Bible says this, and he said, do it a second time. And then they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. He had a moat with an island inside of it, basically, trying to soak down everything. They didn't say that the prophets of Baal did that, just so you know. So then it says this, and it came to pass at the time of the offering in verse 36 of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God, now remember what's happening. These 450 prophets of Baal are cutting themselves. They're throwing themselves on the altar. They're gushing with blood, trying to get some word from their God. And the Bible says that Elijah just comes out. They're out. Remember, it's the first one to fire. It's not. If both get fired, it's the first one. And he says this, verse 36, and it came to pass, verse 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that thou hast turned their back again to you. Now listen to this. Verse 38. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the little God. The Lord, he is the God. Now, last scripture that I want you to remember today. It says this, and Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal. Don't forget what this is. Let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and killed them there. Remember that. You know, we live in a culture that halts. We live in a culture that wants things at very little expense to themselves. The last thing that this culture is wanting is a living sacrifice. They don't want to present themselves. You know, they'll be, what is it, the chicken. They'll give the eggs. They'll be the cow that gives the milk. They don't want to be the pig because that just gives a little bit too much. So here we find that these people, the Israelites, have halted. They've stopped. And I, I want to read to you exactly what halting means. There's two things. First, a temporary stop. As in marching, then something causes you to pause. And the second is a command to stop. Now, what's happening here with the Israelites as Elijah faces them is that they claim the name of Yahweh. They were saying they were Israelites. They weren't Canaanites. They weren't Jebusites. They weren't mosquito bites. They weren't anything like that. They were Israelites. So what had happened was is that they ceased to look like Israelites, but they said they were Israelites. The problem began to occur. They had many people that were around them that didn't want them in the promised land. And so they were saying they were Israelites, Israelites, but they didn't feel it. They didn't have it. They didn't have the fire. They didn't have the smoke. And so what would happen is this. These Canaanites, who were terrified of them at first, they would come up to them and say, oh, you're an Israelite. What, what, what do Israelites do? And they would say, well, you know, it's been, uh, we were nomadic people. We're, you know, we just go around and live off the land and move to the next. And they said, well, wait a second. Are you staying here? And then they said, yeah. And then the Baal people said, well, you got to learn how to farm. Because Baal is the god of the harvest. They said, you can do, you know, you play uh, cornhole Yahweh. You can play dominoes Yahweh. You can do everything you want to do Yahweh. But when it comes time to the harvest, you better be about Baal. Now, what's the most important thing to a farmer? The harvest. So what they were telling is you can have everything you want to be with Yahweh, but when it gets important, you better give up on them and come over here if you want to harvest. And we as Christians in our culture today, it's very similar to this. We have more people claiming to be saved than ever before. Yet our culture is as despondent as it has ever been. So what we have is we have a change of belief without a change of behavior. People claiming a name, but not fitting a description. 
And what's happening is, is people need peace. You do, we need hope. We need fire. Fire is required. It isn't that just worldly people need fire. Christian people need fire. It's the, it's the evidence, uh, the fire, the peace, the joy, the love, everything that God promotes and expounds, and that's what we need. But it can't happen in broken Christianity. It can't happen when they halt. You, don't ha- you have some peace until you are halted, until you reach something that causes you to pause in your Christian walk, or until something is your, your master and causes you to stop. He said, how long have you halted between two opinions. It's really simple. There's not 50 different things that we have to decide on. We have to decide on if we want to be with God or not. In this contemporary society, it would be be with God or be in the world. Because you can't be both, you will be halted. You will stop. You will not have that living water flowing out of you. Your cup won't be pressed down and overwhelming because you have been halted. Now, do you think that Jesus came and did what he did? For us to be able to be halted? Do you think that we should be out worried? That we're a bunch of fraidy cats? Oh, I'll serve the Lord, but man, I I can't be here. I can't be here. I remember talking to a guy who had got saved and he was a drug addict. And he goes, I just don't want the dope uh, to come to me. You mean the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't bigger than the dope man that, that he's worried about? I said, if you have that fire, if you get dig deep, and if you go him, that dope man won't come near you because the enemy won't want him to be lost. We'll be out winning people. We won't be on the run. Do you ever see Christianity on the run? We're not a bunch of Freddy cats. Let me see if I can get back up here. Listen, um, so either way, we become enslaved and we lose our liberty when we're worried about if we're serving God or not. The Bible says no man can serve two masters. He loves one and he hates the other. Then when he's with the other, he loves them and hates them. We have to decide in 2020, do we want real Christianity or do we want broke Christianity? Because if you are halted, I'm not talking about a buffet of sin. I'm just saying if you have areas in your life that are outside the, the, the space of God, you will halt and you will not experience what Jesus died for you to experience. You know there is peace that does pass understanding, don't you? You know there is joy that is unspeakable. You know that there's a Holy Ghost power, a comforter, that will never leave you nor forsake you. That we won't worry what man can do to us because he is with us. Think about that. We need real Christianity in the society that we live in. And you know if you have it. It ain't no wonder. You know if your Christian walk is broken or if it is fluid and moving. You know. Christianity that is, has no liberty is based on circumstances. It's, think about it. I'll worship God if somebody doesn't offend me. I'll pray for somebody if this... Oftentimes, a Christian's kindness nowadays is to get back something from who they're being kind to. Whether if it's a thank you or this, that, something. If we do anything that has any narcissistic revolution, then it ain't, it ain't from real Christianity. So the Bible says Christianity, we find in our culture, it's blended. We don't just, oh, we don't, we don't like God, but, oh, it's work for Christian and live however we want to live. The people didn't have fire. People lost their intimacy. Think about this. What's the one person you don't want with you if you're going to go out and do something you shouldn't do? Man, but you know, the Bible says Jesus sticks closer to us than a brother. We drag him through all that mess. But what we try to do, like we talked about the other day, is with the prodigal son, we go to the father and we say, I want you dead. Give me my inheritance. I don't want you in my life. The uh, uh, Jews in the Gospels, Jesus was crucified because the Jews didn't want their job to be lost in the temple. They didn't want God to be moving outside the temple, and they wouldn't be needed. So again, my, my question to you is, is if you have real Christianity, then you have to have fire. Not fire that can be tempered by your circumstances, but fire that goes beyond. So real Christianity is an intimacy with God. Do you have it? I bet you 95, 99% of us would raise our hand and say that we're saved. 
You know your salvation is no more real than your devotional life. What, what, I want you to, what I want you to see is if you are balanced on the edge because what you're serving or the God that you're praying to or whatever isn't necessarily real, there's a reason because it's broken in your life. There is a real God that can be found in his space. We have to go into that. Now, let me tell you how you get into it. Jesus busted a hole wide open for you. It's wide and it's high, and you can get into it. And in that presence of the Father, that's what makes us who we are. Not if you've been a Christian for 30 years, not if you tithe, not if you sing, not if you teach, not if you come to church. All that is is about time. We're not talking about time. We're talking about space, crossing over. Let me tell you, if you're built on time, you'll be like me. I pray 15 minutes, and I'm like, man, I've been praying for four hours, and it's been 15 minutes. And I'll try to feel good about myself because of time spent. But I'm telling you what, if you get in the presence of God and you get in his space, you could be there in two minutes, and you would be completely revolutionized to be able to maintain a Christianity that works and goes in this world. That's what we need. I don't want you sitting here saying, well, you know, it's really not my thing. If you get to the cross, if you get into the space of God, you'll never be the same. Don't see my power. See the Lord's power. And this is what the Bible says. Uh, uh, people lost their interest in me, Missy. So they, they worship far off. Remember, Jesus says that my people uh, worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They're not in the space of God. Uh, then they worshiped a God in time, but not in space. Now, understand this. Man with no godly fire. Now, I'm going to read this exact. Man with no godly fire. If your Christianity is broke, if you have some peace, some joy, if you have some power, but no godly fire, they chase fire rather than chase God. So if you do not have the fire of God in your life, you will chase that fire rather than you chase God. So what you do is you chase the blessings and not the blesser. You don't go after him. You go after his inheritance. You see what we're back to? Now, the Bible says that we have to um, get into his, uh, what's the best word we could say, uh, a shared space so that we can... Let me, let me say this. If your fire, if what gets you lit is material possessions like a home, a car, if it's your health, if you're a great fitness thing, if, that, if that's your fire, because remember now, the, the Baalites were trying to get fire from their God. They were doing everything they could. They were committed to it. They were throwing themselves on a burnt offering. They were cutting themselves until they gushed blood. I'd get a paper cut, and I'm like, God, why? I mean, these people were committed to it, and that's what we face with people in the world. They are committed that money will be the key. They are committed that that home will be what they need, that relationship will be what they need. But I'm telling you, when you make 100000 you want 101000 When you have a home, you want a pool. And then after you have a pool, you want everything dressed up. It never stops. It will never stop subside you. You will never be full. You will always thirst at this fire that the world tries to offer you. And, and, and really, make no mistake about it. Fire isn't optional. When you serve in the Lord in his space, you will be on fire. It will not be an option. You can fall down on your face like Isaiah did, but fire will touch you. You can be in a, a, a locked behind in an ark, but the Bible says God will remember you. You can be Joshua and you can shout for Jericho's walls to be fall down. You can do all that because that is natural for the believer. That's not exceptional. That's not something that, whoa, wow, that person has fire. That's the basis origin of your salvation. When you've been baptized into death and raised in the likeness of Jesus, that resurrection power is the fire that you will be endued with. So the Bible says we have to be a Christianity that has space of God, a shared Jesus, rather than the presence that he has. I mean, Without the fire, Jesus basically becomes a Santa Claus, right? Gives you what you need. But with fire, we have what's called imperpetuity. 
Do you know what in perpetuity means? It means, it means it can never run out. If someone has something in perpetuity, it means there's no, oh, he's got $20. It, there's no, deal. he gets it. And everything that you get through the fire of God is in perpetuity of the eternal nature of God. Meaning that the peace, the hope, the joy, the mercy, the ability to forgive, the ability to witness, the ability to be, do, is naturally always going to be there for you. You don't have to wonder, am I going to make it today? Am I going to be around my, my neighbor? Am I going to be able to be around my workplace? You will have the blessings of God in perpetuity. The Israelites did not have an answer for their actions. They knew that they did not have the power that came from Yahweh. They were actually not sure if that power from Yahweh was better than the power from Baal. What fire do you want? Are you going to love something? You know what I, you know what I learned? With Christianity, the fire brings you a look. There's a look about people on fire. So, do you have that look? You can't get it. You get set on fire and it's there. Look's important. Because, you know, I know what you see when you look at me. I get it. Frankie, you see an athlete. I know you do. I know you do. Somebody today just called me Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I was like, no, it's not Brad Pitt either. It's just me. I get it. I get, you guys see an Albert Einstein mind. I get it. It's big. I mean, I'm a mathlete just like my daughter. I mean, I see it. George saw it. Oh, my goodness. I counted. I six oh George like 18 times in a row. I got to feel bad for him. He saw it. He, he won't even stand on my left anymore. He don't want no part of me. Different table. Different table. So that wasn't always the case, though. So when I was, God, I was 10 years old, I loved football basketball and baseball. I was in Iowa. I turned sideways, you couldn't even see me. I, I mean, I was a string bean, size 12 feet, I bet, at that time. But you know what they like to do in Iowa? They like football, basketball, and, and baseball. But you know what else they like? They don't wrestle. They wrestle. And so I'm like, well, well wrestling will be all right. Because Hulk Hogan, I'll just do my leg drop on it. It wasn't that kind of wrestling. Now, let me, it was this wrestling that started with a very different type of uniform than what I felt comfortable with when I was 10 years old. Have you seen that uniform where it's like tights and it comes up into like over? Bro, it don't do nothing for you. And, and so I'm, I, I get this on and I'm embarrassed. How do you have a look when you're embarrassed? You know, how do you do that? You know, the way you're going to be dressed by the Lord is going to be different spiritually than the way you're dressed by the world. The world's going to try to make you look cool. They're going to try to make you feel good. But God's going to give you exactly what you need to be a warrior on fire for him. And it may look funny to the world. And you can't worry about it because, I mean, I tell you, I, about it. if you had a picture, you, uh, it was bad. It was bad. So I, I did it. I didn't have a choice. My dad was a drill sergeant. I did what he said. And then they put this little thing on you, and it, it, it was too tight. I didn't like it. And, and I had, like, size 12 shoes, really, when I was 10. And so I was flopping around in these shoes, and I'm walking. It's, it's wintertime. See it. The, the, the steam off the ground's in there. I get out of the car clinking with big size 12 shoes, and I'm four foot tall, and I got this wrestling outfit that just... It's just not good. So I, the, the smoke is coming up around me. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm embarrassed, but I've got to do it. So I go in there. And did you know what people in Iowa do? And I was 10, and I was just starting. Man, when you start to crawl, they start teaching them how to wrestle. They, they were 10 years old and had eight years' experience. They also did not like me, which, you know, it was not good. So what happened was is we go to this meet, and, and somebody came on the bus. She was a cheerleader. Her name was Darla Jean Stockton. Oh, DJ. She was my Winnie from the Wonder Years. I loved her. And we were talking and everything. And then all of a sudden it hit me. She's going to see me get killed out there. So my friend, and, and this is his name, Buck Rogers. I'm not kidding you. Buck was as cool as you could be. He was a big guy, and nobody wanted to mess with him. So I'm thinking, all right, Buck, give me some hints. And Buck says, Tim, it's not about wrestling. It's about the look. You've got to have a look. 
And I was like, oh, look, what do you mean? He goes, when it gets serious, when they start snotting and slobbering on you and driving your head in the mat, you better have the look. And I was like, what kind of look, Buck? Tell me. He goes, he gave me a look of a man that had been constipated for two months. He went, ah! And I was like, man, I can't do that. That's embarrassing. I can't look like that. Well, let me tell you what. You're going to look and act different when you're on fire from God. It's going to be totally strange to you. And you may feel like, man, I can't go out and talk to this person. Or I can't sing. Or I can't teach. Or I don't know how to witness. But I'm telling you what. The fire of God will give you that look. And it will terrify the enemy. Just as it has always done it in our tradition. So I was a little bit... I had a little post-traumatic stress disorder from Buck showing me his look. And uh, DJ was right there talking to me because, you know, she, I was everything to her. And uh, I get it. And uh, so we get out. And I'm thinking, this is all right. This is not bad because there was nobody in my weight division. Because I'm telling you what, I was tall, but there was nothing else to me. I looked like a stick man. So I didn't figure that I was going to have to wrestle. That's great. But then, you ever, you ever had a glass of water in Jurassic Park? And it starts to tremble. Then I heard big giant steps. Boom, boom. And everybody stopped. And it was Joe Pillman. Let me tell you about Joe Pillman. This kid I had known since I was six years old. He was purposely bald headed at 10. He shaved his head clean at 10 years old. He was big and he was ugly. Even his mama didn't like him. And he had one eyebrow from ear to ear. Looked like a, a rainbow, a hairy rainbow. It was awful. And he snorted, and, and when he walked, and he just slobbered. He probably couldn't tie his shoes. We were arch enemies. Let me tell you why, Frankie. Because he was a Washington Redskin fan. Oh. So... His dad walked up to my dad and said, hey, neither one of our sons, because no one was big enough to wrestle him, and no one was small enough to wrestle me. And he goes, why don't we just have our sons wrestle each other? <laughs> Good one, dad. So I'm, I'm walking, and again, I'm in his shadow. I'm in his shadow. And we go out to the mat. You ever seen a wrestling mat? Big square with circle in it. So he was on, on one side, and I was on the other. I was like, all right, I'll float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Right? I'm quick, I'm fast, I'm, I'm feisty. And they told me to get down on all fours. What are you talking about? And they let him hover over me. And I'm thinking, this is, I didn't even know that's how it started. So I'm down, he's breathing and snot, and it's just awful. And his mother's ready to call the police on him because she don't like him. And then all of a sudden, they started the thing, and all I saw was from here going up. And all the way over. And he picked me up and slammed me down. And he was rubbing his face on my face in the... Oh, it was awful. And uh, at the beginning of it, this is what I heard. Go, Tim. Go, Tim. That was Darla Jean, man. And then I went over and I hit the rug. And this is what I heard. Oh, Tim. Oh, Tim. And then, so half my face is in the mat, and I, uh, the other half is squished because Joe's basically sitting on me. And this is what I see. Dwayne, right where you are, Darla Jean was sitting, and Buck Rogers was talking to her. I was losing my gal over this, and I didn't know what to do. So there's a time in our Christianity that it ain't going to be good origins. You may start on the wrong side of things, but with fire, with Holy Ghost fire that you've been empowered with, it doesn't matter if it's above you, on top of you, or around you. You may feel like you're losing, but I'm telling you what, if you did what I did at that moment, I got the look. I went, ah! And boy, he jumped up. Darla stopped talking to Buck, and I ran up, ran off the mat. Bible says the steps of a righteous man will be ordered by God. <laughs> so they called a whistle, and basically they started us on both sides. Buck seven, uh, Joe was seven foot six probably. Um, he was mad. And I saw Darla Jean looking to see what I would do. 
And I had to make a decision. Because up until that time, my wrestling career was halted. I didn't like it. I was doing it because I was made to do it by my dad. I didn't like the benefits of it. I didn't like the uniform. I didn't like the look. I didn't like none of that. But one thing I did like is I liked Darla Jean Stockton. And let me tell you, uh, Joe was over there. He's hitting himself. He's just beating himself up. He's beating his chest. And I had a decision to make. You know what I did? They blew that whistle. And I went, rah, slow motion, rah. And I took steps running towards Joe Pillman. It was on. It was going to be the final countdown. It was over with, him or I. And I went running right at him. And he stands there with a perplexed look on his face with the one eyebrow. And uh, he had big overhead. He looked like uh, so easy a caveman could do it, uh, like most Washington Redskins fans. And, uh, and so he ran at me. I ran at him, and I jumped like this. And he caught me. I looked face to face with the devil, man. I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he was snotting and snorting, and he was ready to slam me. And you know what I did? I bit down on his nose like you have <laughs> never seen. I laid into him. He got to hollering and crying, and the referee came out. I wouldn't let go of him, though. He was trying to shove me off. I had his nose, and I was already pot committed. I had to keep going. So they finally got me off of him, and I was crying, and everybody was, like, looking at me like I was strange. And uh, they said, there goes a Star Wars fan, probably, and I was. And so, so my dad came over to me. I'd already been kicked out of wrestling. Joe was prettier with his nose bit. My dad came up to me and I knew I was in trouble, man. I looked different. I acted different. Had to fight outside of what my weight class was. And everybody watched me. And I bit down on a, a, a young man and was disqualified by the world, but you know, that's all right. And you know what my dad came up to me and said? I'm ready to get hammered. My dad said, son, you did what you had to do. Are you doing what you got to do? When the enemy has you up, squeezed in a bear hug, and you're looking at the ugliest mug you've ever seen, are you doing what you got to do? When you got a sick family member, an unsafe family member, you getting out of bed at 1 in the morning, are you crying out in fire to God to save that person and surround that person? Are you praying that there's one, two, five, there's still 10, 15 empty seats in here? Are you on your knees begging God to bring people to us that we may win them and disciple them, that they may experience true power? Is that what you're at? Are you doing what needs to be done? If not, you don't have godly fire. You've halted. Let's go on. Now, we're not going to talk about fire anymore. We're going to talk about what precedes the fire. Listen to this. Verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Before he called out for fire, he made an altar. He became a living sacrifice. He cried out to God from an altar. Do you hear what I'm saying? We cannot have fire before we have an altar. You will be no better than your devotional life. You'll be no more than the time that you spend in the space of God. You just won't. But the Bible says here that Elijah came and he repaired it. Thank God for Elijah. We live in a culture that has lost its Elijah. We live in a culture that there's only wants for fire, no desire for sacrifice. People are only building temples for, for praise or not building temples for prayer. Listen to this now. It, the Bible says, I'm going to go deep, Leviticus 27, 28. However, anything that's set apart for the Lord whether it's a person, animal, or family property, must never go back. Anything devoted in this way has been set apart as holy, and he belongs to the Lord. Do you hear what I'm saying? When you experience true fire from God, you are sanctified and set apart. 
You are no longer part of the world. Your origination is no longer from Adam, but from Jesus who resurrected you from the death. The Bible says that we must be separate, wholly separate. That, you know, that's the thing. I, have, I had parts of my life that were separate. Parts of my life that weren't so separate. But the fire of God will cleanse you from those areas and will solely set you apart. We are to be devoted. We are to be a living sacrifice. We are to have an altar repaired in our home, at our workplace, at our school, in our church. And every relationship that we have should have an altar repaired. And we should be a living sacrifice. We should climb on top of it, build ourselves in, and say, God, just as they did in the Old Testament, here I am, take me. That doesn't mean you simply call out to God through singing. That means that we pray and fast in a, in a sacrifice life. The only, listen to this, the only way you can live is if you die first. Don't worry, though. Don't, I'm telling you. I know someone who will raise you back up in fire with all that peace, with everything that heaven promises, you will be there. Now, listen, it doesn't mean that we are simply, the, well, the time that we take, let me, let's talk about this real quick. Have you ever, anybody ever invested any money? Go ahead, raise your hand if you did. Nobody? We need to have Ramsey here. Um, have you ever went to something knowing that it was going to be bad? I mean, come on. You, anybody went to their in-laws? You know, I'm just kidding. Just kidding, just kidding. Don, you ever went to something that you knew was going to be bad? Have you, ever, have you ever, when you're growing up, guys, have you ever been called out and you have two choices, whether to punk out or fight knowing you're going to get beat up? Listen, in Christianity, we cannot have the fire of God until we are a living sacrifice, until we climb on the altar, until it takes from us what our flesh wants, because Jesus ain't trying to teach your flesh anything. He's not trying to remediate it. He's not trying to make it smell good. He's not trying to tickle it and make it behave. Jesus, your creator, God, is about to kill your flesh. He don't want you to have any part of flesh, the Lord doesn't. So you have to be willing to die. Are you willing to take a loss? Are you willing to take an L? Are you willing to get into something that you know you're going to lose your flesh? Think about Jacob when he met the Lord at Peniel. He, he ran from everything. His whole life, he just ran. But he had gotten to such a point, and he had met a man that he knew could change him. He knew he was going to take a whipping. He got a dislocated hip. He got torched down in the mud. But he got changed at the same time. He caught fire at the same time. He was never called Jacob again, but only Israel. He was changed to this very day. Are you willing to take a loss? He, ran, he walked right up to Jesus knowing that he was going to take a whipping, but he would not stop. In the darkness, in the breaking of the day, he wrestled all night long. Are you willing to do what's needed to be done to catch that fire? Or do you want that broke down worldly stuff? That doesn't work when it needs to. You know, you, you ever put a, a key in a car and hoped it worked? Well, there's no liberty there, is there? In the fire of God, it works, and it's a push button. Push button. Are you willing to take a lot? Now, I don't know if you understand. That's hard to do. If you've ever taken a loss, if you've ever been chastised, if you've ever run from that thing in which halted you into the Lord, that refining process may hurt. It may be hard to look at yourself. And when you literally think, oh my goodness, I'm only as close to God as my devotional life. And I barely have one. But I've been 15, 20 years. I've read the Bible back and forth, but I barely have a devotional life. We can't wish what we want to be. We have to be who we are. And that's either in Christ and it's motivated to move forward or not. I don't care how long you went to church. Fire is fire from the moment you get it. So look at this. What about the leper? He was on a one-way trip. When he went to meet Jesus, 
Jesus was in his popularity. There were thousands of people around Jesus. A leper wasn't allowed to be around one. Could you imagine being one person that wasn't allowed to be there, that was so revolting and disgusting in their sight and their smell, around thousands of people to find one man? It didn't say Jesus was walking by. He went to find him. He didn't have a two-way trip. The first person he touched, he was able to be put to death. They were probably screaming in horror and getting away from him. He was never going back. Are you willing to do what needs to be done? When that leper fell on his face, he was a dead man. And either Christ was going to raise him up or he was going to never be found again. Jesus just so happened to raise him up. The woman with the issue of blood, the moment she went in the midst of them, it was game time. She could never go back. All these examples, Mary outside the tomb. She said she had nowhere else to go. What, was she going to go back to being a demon-possessed prostitute? She had nowhere else to go. Has God saved you so far? Have you been on fire so much that there ain't no looking back? Will you take a loss? Will you let God drive you into your death so he can raise you up in his likeness? Listen to this. The Israelites, as Elijah prepared, they went up to him. They saw that there was an altar. They stayed there. Listen to this. If you are half in and half out, your sacrifice will not be accepted. You can tell God you love him. He knows if you do or not. The Bible says in John chapter 2 that he doesn't need a man to testify of himself because he knows the hearts of all men. What I'm trying to get you to do is see yourself today not as you want to be, not as you were, but see yourself who you are. And then at that point, we can begin to fix it. In my life, I bet in everybody's life here, there are areas that need to be fixed, but you have to see it. If you don't love your Bible, you ain't got the fire of God. If you don't love your brother or sister, even the ones that aggravate you, even the ones that whose daughter calls them has the traits of being, what, what do you say? Irritable. I'm able to make Hannah irritable. I mean, I love it. It makes me happy. But, but if you're that, you have to be able to get with the thing if you have the fire of God. Now, this is the thing. We think, okay, great. He built an altar. Verse 30, he called down fire. Verse 37. Verse 33, verse 34 talks about how they said, yes, he's the God, he's the God. There was an, uh, uh, no longer a halting. There was a fire. There was a desire. Do you know the first thing that Elijah did? Look at verse 40. And Elijah brought unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not them, one of them, not one of them escape. Now, you know these prophets of Baal were trying to get out of town when that fire came down, don't you? He said, don't let one of them. This is, this is after you have been saved. God is saying to you, those things that would separate you, those things that are of the world, don't let one of them escape. Bring them all to me. Amen. I mean, that's the God that we serve. Every addiction, every hurt, everything from the past that you maul over, bring it to him. The Bible says to cast it to him. And that word means you cast it, not carry where it lands. It's gone. That's a good casting. Elijah said unto them, take all the prophets, let none of them escape. And they took them. They did it. Now, do you think that's a big deal that they did it? I'm going to tell you why it's a big deal. Because the Bible says... God tells Moses, this is way back, speaking to the children of Israel, the same people that Elijah is talking to, and saying to them, when you pass over the Jordan and go into the land of Canaan, when you go to the space of God, then you will drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their molten images and demolish all their high places. This was supposed to have been done. Had they done it, there would be no prophets of Baal. 
that they had to deal with. There would be no halting because when you get saved, when you get in the space of God, God looks at you and says, chase because that's what he calls you. Bring it all to me. Will you? Oh, man, we need to be a church of people that bring it all. You know what I'm saying? We need to be a church that has these things in their crosshairs where they're looking for sin or fakeness or uh, any type of spiritual abduction. They're looking for it, and they're dragging it by its head. They're pulling it by its feet, and they're throwing it into the space of God. You have to bring it all, I'm telling you. Jesus talked to the rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler thought he was too rich. And he wouldn't bring that to the Lord. And the Bible says he went away, which is ice erkomai, meaning that he went away never to come back. His whole life he stayed in a state of going away from the Lord because of one thing. We, the Bible says, are naked and manifest before the Lord. The Bible says in Romans that nothing can separate you, not even nakedness. When Jesus was resurrected, the first thing he did was take off his grave clothes because it didn't matter what we looked like anymore. Let me tell you what, you're worried about what Jesus sees. The Bible says your walls are always before them. He knows already. You can smile it off. You can tithe it off. You can attend it off. But he knows if you've taken everything to him. The Bible says in the purpose of the fire, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that the people may know that you are the Lord. The, peop the purpose of the world's fire is possession, is created things, money maybe. Maybe it's their health. Maybe it's a relationship. That's the fire that lights them. But in the world, the fire that lights us, listen to this again. The fire that lights us says this, hear me, O Lord. Hear me, that this people, the fire's coming down, that they may know, remember they're halted, that they may know thou art the Lord God and that you, they, that you have turned their heart back again. And that, now, now think about that. When you are in the fire, God will turn your heart. You don't have the strength. You may get there on your knees. You may be so addicted to something that you've never been able to shake it. But you get into that space and that fire hits you, God will turn you back to facing him, away from where you were facing and getting your stuff from the world. The Bible says also, that when he says, hear me that the people may know. The people didn't say it themselves. Somebody brought them together. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.18, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to, Jesus, uh, to himself by Jesus and hath given to us. The ministry of reconciliation. Somebody that's on fire for God, ask people to join them in their walk. Somebody that's on fire from God is driven to people that they don't know, that they may witness and tell their story. It's not option. It's not leather or cloth. It's not sunroof or moonroof. It's none of that. It's part of the fire that you will be on fire and be a minister of reconciliation. Let me tell you what. You will pray, man. You will pray so hard. You will dig so deep. You will be as Jesus in Gethsemane and grind and claw because you know what fire. Remember, we need fire. Our souls will always search for it. People are just searching for strange fire. The Bible says this, Acts 1.13, and I'm almost ready. It says, displays the upper room fire that was preceded 40 days of sacrifice of prayer, preceded the fire of God coming down. Sacrifice precedes the fire. And the fire distinguishes the old inhabitants that were always supposed to go away. The purpose of fire for me to be on fire is so that you can see it. The purpose for you to be prayed up and finding God when nobody can see it is because when you're around people, they will see it. The fire of a Holy Ghost in a believer is different than anything that we would ever see. But you cannot get to it without sacrifice. Somebody tried to buy it. He ended up blind. It, people want the cheap and easy way. But the Bible says that you personally, you who are saved, have been bought with a price. Now serve him. I ask you this. This world. Oh, listen to this. Verse, uh, verse 33 and 34. Let's read this real quick. It says this. 
And he put the wood in order and cut the bullocks and laid them on the wood and said, fill it with water. And he did. And he said, do it again and do it again, do it again, do it again. What that is saying to us is we didn't manufacture the fire. We didn't get together and rub sticks and create a spiritual climate. This fire could only come from God. And when the Holy Ghost fire is on you, people will say, that ain't so-and-so. That has to be God. When you're on fire for the Lord, it's so separate that no one will ever say it's you. They will always say it's God. Nobody said that that was Elijah's fire. They said, the Lord, he is the God. They didn't say nothing about Elijah. That's where we know it's Holy Ghost fire is when the the person that's on fire You don't see them anymore. You simply see the Lord. I'm almost done here. Listen to this in closing. The first first part of closing. There'll be seven closings. No, I'm kidding. The Bible says, Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The Bible says the works of the world are like wood, wood, hay, and stubble. That when they go through the refining process, they burn up. That's some fire, right? So wood, hay, and stubble can get a little bit of fire. It just burns up. It doesn't make it through the refining process. You can't get through the Red Sea. You know, what's interesting is, is that God told Moses to stretch forth his, his what? His rod, Okay. To part the Red Sea. And he did that. And he parted the Red Sea. And now everybody was going through and they were still being chased. And then when God looked to, and when they got on the other side, he didn't say, stretch forth your rod. He didn't say it. He said, stretch forth your hand. That you get through by the power of God. You stay through by your choice. You can close up your Red Seas through the fire of God. You'll have that choice. You won't want nothing to do with those things. And you will find a peace, a hope, a joy that will be so overwhelming that you'll just, well, why didn't I do this before? You'll be a so shiner. Do you want shine or do you want so shine? Man, I want some so shine. This This church needs some so shine. When we worship, we need a bunch of people with so shine. You don't get so shine here. You get so shine in your devotional life on the altar. When you climb up, strap yourself down, and belt yourself in, and call down the fire as a living sacrifice can call. When you need peace, you can call down fire. When you need hope, you can call down fire. When you need wisdom, healing, whatever, you can call down fire. You will be a fire calling guy. I'm telling you what. Somebody will come up to you and try to aggravate you, Hannah, in the morning. You'll just be some so shiner. It won't matter. You'll just call down fire. It won't be them burning up. It will refine you. And it will take that irritation, and you will so shine some kindness or so shine some pay app for your dad for your telephone bill. You, you can so shine something. It's good to have some so shine. I'm going to tell you this. Let's stand together. Everything I've said to you, having that look, being able to deal with being different, with looking different, with acting different, with going to different places, being able to deal with that, it only comes from an altar. You'll have a lot of altars, man. You'll have an altar in your relationship with God that is your main one. You have an altar in your church. You have an altar in your relationship. You should. If you don't have an altar with your mate, no matter how long you've been married, you're not having the fire of God in your life. You guys should have an altar. If you have somebody that you don't know who's saved, you should have a lost person's altar. You got to have an altar, many of them. You'll carry them around all day. But you will have some fire, man. The altar is the timber in which the Holy Spirit is lit. Did you hear me? Do you have it? Oh, man, it's here. I'm telling you, man, you can have some so shine today. You can get that look. I'm telling you, it's here. 
I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is here. God is here. And you might say, I don't understand all that. You know what? I get on a plane, I don't understand nothing. But once I get on that plane, I'm pot committed. I'm ready to go. Doesn't matter if I can fly or not. The pilot, he's got to take me home. And I'm telling you, you will have an amazing pilot if you just get in. You know if you've halted. You know if there's areas of your life that are hidden from God. Have you taken everything to the Lord? Or do you still have some little outliners? If you got to deal with Joe Pillman's like I did, you need the fire of God. You got to be willing to do whatever it takes. Don't leave here without it. It's here. God is here for you. So I'd like you, if you could, to close your eyes and bow your head. In your heart, if you want some so shine, If you want that fire, know that you need to be able to be that living sacrifice. But you're failing in those areas. Just let the Lord, tell the Lord, I get it. I'm not so shining. I got some worldly fire. I don't have the fire of God in my life. You can do that. No one will know. No one will know because what you're doing right now is you're constructing an altar. And the hidden altar is the most important one. Because that's between you and God. There's no faking when you get into that hidden altar. You can't keep Jesus on the porch. He's busting into the house. Listen, don't leave without it. So right now, you could be a church member like me. You could be a church member for the longest time. Or you could be a new person that's never been here before. If you want real Christianity, not that fake stuff that is being experienced in the world, but if you want it straight from the source... I want to invite you to come up. If you could think of one area of your life that you haven't brought to the Lord, bring it right now. It's fine. I'd come up here 25 times. Come on, come forward. If anybody here today wants that so shine, you need that look. We want to ask the Lord to bless us. All right, we've been coming together as a church down to the altar. It'll be hard. But as our church, let's come to the altar today. And let's seek God as we do. And I'll give it to Pastor Shell after that. But come forward. Let's get together. Let's rebuild this altar. This altar is what 2020 will be about. It will be about prayer and sacrifice for godly fire. So come. Find some people in your mind that you know you you need to pray for and seek God for them. Find some areas of your life. Father, we love you and bless you. Thank you for my buddy. In the name of Jesus, God, bless our church, Father. Bless our church. God bless you, brother.